Hello, everybody. My name is Kirk Spano, and today we have a special guest. It's uh, Dr. Sean Stein-Smith. He's been on before. Uh, he is a professor at Lehman College, which has some big things going on. I'll let him mention that in a minute. Wall Street uh, Bitcoin Board, the Gilded Finance Board. I don't even know what that is. Uh, the Power 50, uh, the 40 under 40. I just found out he's 33. That makes me cry a little bit. Um, but, you know, I just watched the Matrix movie. And the one thing I will say is this guy has like crazy crypto superpowers and, and <laughs> he can just pick the stuff out and, and he knows what it means. So, yeah, he has a huge accounting background, which I think is real important given that we're going into the uh, digital finance age. Uh, my uh, readers and folks who listen to my webinars know that I'm really big on NFTs, uh, not the you know cute little picture NFTs, uh, but I would like to finance real estate with them and uh, group ownership of collectibles and things like that. So we'll ask them about that. So Sean, how are you doing today? Uh, doing great, Kurt. Happy to be back here on the show. And there's a ton to talk about from NFTs to DeFi. It's a whole bunch going on. So I'm really amped for it. All right, great. Um, why don't we jump right into it? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, you did your uh, crypto uh, predictions for this year. Oh, and no. You, and, you, and you had a big Bitcoin one. Why don't you tell us about your big Bitcoin uh, prediction? All right. So I have a price target for the end of 22. Bitcoin's going to hit 100 grand. And I'm still confident in that. I, I do know that, that at the current time, it's trading quite a bit lower. I don't know, 40, 41, 42, but, but I'm still confident that, that that by the end of 22, that Bitcoin and other crypto assets, right, be it NFTs, be it DeFi, be it Ether, all the rest, are are going to have a, a leg up a year in 2022. And all of this current volatility uh, is honestly more noise and headline driven for just fundamentals. All right. No, I, I, I hear you. Um, I will tell you that I'm taking the over on that one. Okay. Uh, I, I do think Bitcoin will get to 100,000, but I just worry about the volatility of, of all the broad uh, asset-based markets. So I agree it'll get there. I have no idea if it gets there within a year, um, but it makes sense to buy the dips, I think. Uh, we'll, yeah. see. we'll see. Um, what, what are your other big themes for this coming year? What, what do you think that people should really learn about so that they don't miss all of this. I mean, you know, I focus on a lot of the companies involved in, in, in uh, mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies. You know, I'm a big PayPal and Square guy about PayPal at the IPO back when nobody was even talking about crypto because I knew that it was probably going to get there someday. And this is what, 70 years ago. Um, what are your big things? Are big, big, big things that people really ought to take the time to, to read up on, read your articles at Forbes. Yeah, so, uh, so probably the... The top two or three areas featured uh, in the articles at Forbes, obviously, and then other places too, is one this the whole conversation on how to brokers and how and how those individuals and institutions are actually defined going forward will then change what the compliance and the and the and the tax side of this whole conversation is, right? Because right, because crypto is a it's a hot topic, it's a it's a buzzy area. Everyone likes talking about it, but the income tax angle on crypto is complicated as is, and is only going to get more complicated going forward. So if you are buying, selling, holding crypto of, of any kind during 2022, definitely do your homework, talk to your uh, CPA, wealth management person, and have your documentation in order uh, to the real conversation around any of these uh, stable coins, right? Any of these privately issued coins, tokens, stable coins. I would argue personally that that's in 2022 and in 23, that's going to be the main story. Um, during the fourth quarter of this past year, the President's Working Group issued a 28-page document on this exact area, going through outlining what they are, how they work, pros and cons. Probably a a bit biased, I would say, towards the cons, but but it's obviously a hot topic. It's on the radar of the FDIC, the OCC, the White House, Congress. I mean, all of them are honed in on this area, and all of those types of coins and tokens 
are the coins and tokens being used for actually doing transactions? So building on that first point, the whole tax and clients angle, it is going to be very, very interesting, I think, to see how this ultimately goes forward in terms of, well, do we want to make these uh, privately issued <clears throat> asset backed coins and tokens part of how transactions are conducted? One. And then two, if yes, how do we create a tax framework, policy framework that actually uh, has that happen? Right. Boring stuff done. And then three, okay. NFTs, baby. <laughs> NFTs are here to stay. I do know that NFTs get a ton of crap, but NFTs are here to stay. And because the whole idea of an NFT, you know, uh, board apes, crypto kitties, people, right. you know, all of that is just hot air, right? And the true underlying nature and the real sort of value add of NFTs is a blockchain based virtual record of ownership, right? Both in the tangible world and uh, in the online world, metaverse, virtual world, all the rest. Right. Like if so, I want to buy a new hammer for my game. And yeah. Strike down the, the dwarves and kill the dragon. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Go, yeah. right. And, you know, so while we work backwards here, so the NFTs, um, I'm looking to start a company uh, in real estate development uh, and I want to fund it with NFTs. I saw that somebody just uh, funded a golf course using NFTs. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, I, I forget exactly what the nature was. I just scanned it real quick. I don't know if it was a sustainable golf course or they're throwing condos on it. I don't know what the deal is. I know that you can golf there if you own an NFT. So I guess it was like buying a lifetime membership and, and funding the construction of the course. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the future of NFTs is all the different types of contracts, ownership structures that you can do with them. Because somebody asked me about NFTs the other day at, at a poker game. And they're like, these NFTs are garbage. I'm like, what do you mean? You go, what do I care if there's, you know, a little happy guy that I can buy? He's the only happy guy on the internet. He's the happiest guy on the internet. And I pay for to own that image. And I'm like, well, okay. So here it is. Gamers have a reason to use NFTs right <laughs> now. And, 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 and weird digital art collectors. I shouldn't even say weird. I mean, it's not my thing, but whatever. Um, digital art, right? So why can't that become for tangible and, you know, for hard assets uh, to bring the cost of titling real estate down, to bring the legal expenses and all the transfer expenses down like solar hat, like solar did in the last decade, 70, 80, 90 percent. And, 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 and then have a permanent verified audit trail of who owns what and how much. And, and I think that to me, that's the most exciting because, you know, how much money do we blow on shuffling paper it's it, it's 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 for sure hundreds of billions right you know so mm -hmm. there's there's just a lot of efficiency that can be built into the system i know certain people who shuffle paper and make money doing it by the hour are going to be a little unhappy about <laughs> that but they're probably the first ones to invest in this stuff i would imagine yeah so no and i mean yeah i mean so the whole the whole upside of this nft space is far beyond just just owning images or or artwork right you are 100 percent right that this idea that now I can sort of crowdfund ownership of golf courses, real estate, collectibles, anything, right? So now I can actually crowdfund the ownership. And two, I can then raise raise capital. But doing that uh, also raises all of the other issues at the, uh, uh, the SEC. Yeah, so, the yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I, I don't know if this is the whole country... Um, but I believe in Wisconsin, once you have more than 15 investors, you have to register, right, under blue sky okay. laws. Yeah. So I'm guessing something like that is going to happen, is they're going to regulate and say, okay, look, can't just operate Wild West. You have to do all the verification things. You have to mm -hmm. register it. You have to tell us how we can check on you, yeah. um, you know, give us, you know, the, the keys or, or, you know, like in, in, you know, I'm an investment advisor and I get audited from time to time. Um the regulators will have to have a way of auditing all of this stuff. Yeah. So, you know, how they put that in place, uh, I don't know. Do you, do you know, kind of, do you kind of have an idea of how that's going to happen? How long it's going to take? When is this going to be less wild West? And when are, you know, however many people are involved in crypto now, a few percent, when does that become normal? So let's say going sort of backwards, right? Sort of the actual timeline for all this enforcement, compliance, more more transparency. I would say that all of that is going to come faster than uh, most folks think. 
right? Because every policy agency, every you know body is extremely interested in trying to in trying to add some more clarity in this space, right? One to help us as a marketplace, but two to then have a process to actually tax, right? Right, the assets and the gains and the transactions happening in this area. So I would say that I would not be surprised to have a real comprehensive sort of framework. I would say probably not in 22 or 23, but by 25, it is going to be much more transparent and easier to understand in, in terms of, okay, fine, I'm doing this. How do I do it in a manner uh, on the up and up, basically? And so then sort of building on that in, in, in terms of sort of how this becomes mainstream, I would say that NFTs really, uh, as an idea, are already mainstream, right? Everyone's heard of NFTs. Now it's now it's more a matter of just, okay, fine. Everyone's heard of NFTs, great. But NFTs are a lot more than, than only headlines. And so then how do we try to get good projects, good examples, right? Because obviously, as in any new area, right, there are frauds and bad actors out there. And so uh, there are going to have to be a few high profile projects, a few high profile examples of this NFT crowdfunding, crowd ownership process working as advertised and helping the average person actually earn some money to actually right. get that going in a more than mainstream manner. Okay. Yeah. I, I, it, it's an interesting world to me. Uh, why don't we jump over to the stable coins? Because to me, oh, stable coins, yeah. that seems like it has to become digital money market accounts. Where, where do you see the stable coins going on the regulation? How are they going to make those not break the buck? Yeah. So, so there actually was during 2020, during 2021, sorry, um, quite a bit of conversation on that exact topic. They even proposed the uh, stable act. And so basically in that act, S-T-A-B-L-E act. So the whole point of that, it was to basically say that, that in order to be a issue of any stable coins, that issuing entity has to be FDIC insured and part of the uh, Fed system. And so all of that is basically where the current conversation is right now. Earlier today, actually, Jerome Powell, he was offering testimony, answering questions, all the rest. And so a comment of his in answering a question, I forget from which member, but, um, but he was saying basically that he fully foresees the U.S. will have its own central bank digital currency, but but that there are going to be private uh, currencies out there that are going to compete with it at the beginning. And so and and the whole narrative has shifted, right? And and it's also important to keep in mind that really the vast vast bulk of all of these payments and transactions that are happening via a stable coins, I believe it's something like like ninety five percent of those transactions are happening using five tokens. And all five are backed on a one-to-one -one basis with the US dollar. Right. So it isn't really as, as like crazy an idea as it might seem. And you know, uh, Paxos and Circle and Tether have been all trying to get their books and records more transparent, having audit-like engagements done on themselves. Right. So, right. so I mean, all of that is part of that process, trying to you know, have some transparency and have some clarity as to how these things actually operate to answer. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, in my head, it just, it just seems like they're going to be digital equivalents of money market funds. I don't know how it can go really any other way. How, how the regulation gets written is over my pay grade, but you know, I, I would, I would imagine they're regulated similar to money market funds. The, the question I would wonder about is would they ever, ever be FDIC insured? Uh, that's, that's pretty well, interesting. Um, well, actually, they currently kind of are, right? Okay. Now, 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 it is not the actual coin that's FDIC covered, right? It's the dollar D deposits right. backing that coin are held on deposit at a FDIC insured bank. So they kind of are indirectly, but, uh, but yeah, in order for it to really go mainstream, there is going to have to be that overt backstop, but to have normal everyday people want to use these things and to trust them right. for payroll transactions all the rest right yeah. well right if schwab can have a money market account why yeah. couldn't paypal have a, a crypto money market account which is kind of what they talked about this last week right yep um tether i've looked at them up and down right 
and just kind of watching them over the last what, couple of years, whenever that lawsuit got fi- filed against them. Yeah. Um, it seems to me, and I'm just a, a kid that lives down the street from a farm. Um, so, you know, I, I have some, some special words for things, but <laughs> it seems to me that they may have had a hole in their balance sheet and that in the last year they've tried to fill it. And I saw how some of the assets shifted around and they're not completely defined. Um, I'm wondering if they found investors to fill that hole in their balance sheet. Cause that's what it seems like to me. Um, and maybe there wasn't a hole, maybe it was just hard to read. Um, but you know, if, if some of these places haven't started really at the buck, but they've gotten there, how does that end up? Do they, they end up getting penalized? Does, does it just end up being a, uh, well, you got there. Um, do, do they get included in the group that ends up being, for lack of a better word, okayed to, to be a digital money market? Um, you know, how do we know that we can trust certain players? I mean, what uh, I would say there is that I've been following Tether quite closely since April of 2019 when that lawsuit went went public. Right. And yeah, I mean, they they did have a hole on their balance sheet, right? And they only just just finally settled all of that in October. So right. so it has been an ongoing issue with them. And and to uh, my eyes, the only way to have any of these issues issuers be okay be authorized to really be treated as a currency alternative i mean full audits are going to have to be part of that conversation right because the right. the because the whole question right to your point do you have assets to support every token out there part right. one and then part two and so here's where it's getting a a bit more uh nuanced now what are those assets are they dollars commercial paper what are those assets that are underpinning your advertised one-to-one pay at the U.S. dollar, right? Is that actually happening? And if not, there have to be, you know, um, footnotes and all kinds of other things in place to help make sure that from a user point of view, investor point of view, regulator point of view, everyone's uh, on the same page with that. So yeah, it's it's on the surface a pretty easy answer, but then uh, actually popping the hood on it, it's a bit more complicated. Yeah. One of the things that I hear a lot of people talk about is, yeah, the, it's all, all going to take the place of a dollar, the dollar's going to crash. Well, I pretty semi famously said on Market Watch in 2012 when everybody was chanting, dollar's going to crash. I said, dollar's going to go on a long term bull market and it'll, it'll, it'll trade in different ranges and it'll just keep going up higher and higher ranges, which is what we've seen for, for nine years. Um, and, and I do expect a pullback the next time the economy needs it uh, to, to juice things back up. But I think the dollar is just going to keep getting stronger in the digital post petrodollar age, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is a, a key to that statement. Um, and, and one of the things that I see with the stable coins and all the digital currencies is that on the stable coin side, where even if there's lots of transactions, if pizza, if people buy their pizza with crypto, um, you know, I, I refer to that because people who know Bitcoin know the guy who bought a pizza for 10, for 10 Bitcoin. And it'd be the most expensive pizza in history. Um, all those stable coins are, have to have high quality liquid assets. So what does that mean? That means they're going to be buying a ton of short-term treasuries. That's not bad for the Federal Reserve, right? <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So, so I look at that and I think to myself, this really could integrate well, but also I think it would integrate differently than what a lot of the DeFi people think. So where's the... Where do the crypto anarchists and the DeFi <laughs> crowd and, and reality all meet? I mean, where where is that meeting? Yeah, so so so, so the whole growth of this of any sort of DeFi application is, is sort of the crypto anarchist 2.0, right? right? Bitcoin was their OG idea, it was their first shot at this, hasn't quite worked as a medium of doing business, right? Has not taken off, has not worked. And so now DeFi is is a take two at it, right? Trying to do yield farming, pooling, mining, uh, staking operations, basically trying to build out a parallel financial system. But all of that, you know, works fine and it works as advertised, but there's a lot of ambiguity as to one, how this stuff works. I can't tell you the the number of people who've asked me personally to comment on individual DeFi projects over the last half year. Right. You know, 
non-expert people, just your average, ordinary right. people trying to get into this space. That to me is a problem, right? Yeah. And and how, I mean, there how have been... I get my money out of the system? Exactly. And so in so in terms of sort of the anarchists out there, I mean, sort of the crypto anarchist, libertarian types, I mean, all of them have been tamed. I would I would say person have been tamed okay. publicly, right? right? And that's you know, DeFi. It's it, it's a really interesting area. I personally have some money in it, but I do not think DeFi will ultimately take over or push out the current financial system for the U.S. dollar. Gotcha. Personally, yeah, it's it's uh you know I I I I'm right there with you. I I I know what the extremes want, right? Mm-hmm. And I look at okay, this is what the regulators want, and they got more yeah. power. So if China is taming this like right before our eyes what happens in the united states and and and, it, and mm-hmm. it's interesting to me i i like i said ultimately you know ethereum and i, I guess i'd ask you let, let's go let's jump over to ethereum because okay. last time we talked um we both agreed that ethereum could become more valuable than bitcoin at some point yep, um, correct where where are we on that so i would say that all of that has been has been paused right 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 because bitcoin's been hit Ether's been hit too, but I would say that all of these applications that all that all of us have been talking about NFTs, DeFi, stable coins, the the vast bulk of them all run on Ether. Ether. Yeah. Right. So so all of that has not changed, and as more transactions take place around Circle or Tether or NFTs, DeFi applications, as as all of those applications grow bigger. Then they are growing larger every single day. Ether and the Ethereum blockchain is only going to increase in its underlying value. Now, in terms of the actual timing, I mean that's probably been paused just uh, just new cause right now. But I would say that yeah, that I'm still bullish on Ether going forward. So let me ask, let me ask a why question for a layman. Sure. The more the Ether gets used for all these NFT and digital contract and and stablecoin projects. Why does that make Ether more valuable as a currency or as, a, as an investment? Sure. So the main thing here, right, is that it's almost like you have two options, right? You have Bitcoin and it's really, 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 really good, but it's only good for one thing, payments, okay. international payments, way to hone in on that. Ether probably isn't as good for international payments. And I do know that there are folks online who would argue other ones, right? But Ether is is like a uh, pocket knife that has 22 different tools. Right. Bitcoin has has one. Really, really good at it. But Ether and uh, the underlying blockchain, they have the flexibility to be more useful to more people. And so building out, it's the exact same thing at Facebook, at Apple, Google, building out that ecosystem, right? That as more people get get hooked into different applications running on this one uh, Ether-based platform, that currency, that company, right, that firm token asset is going to increase in value as more and more institutions, individuals use it and and, and as more assets are allocated to it. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I think people don't quite understand why it becomes valuable just because- yeah, so- yeah, and so probably a a more obvious a parallel here, right? Apple, right? right. BlackBerry, right? You know, Bitcoin okay. is you know, <laughs> no, but but to uh, to highlight that in in a sort of non crypto way, right? right? Right. That you know, BlackBerry was the king, first guy out there, in incredibly good at that one thing, encrypted emails. Right. Excellent at it. Apple isn't as good at that, but it but it built out that whole ecosystem of apps and applications right so from a from a supply demand perspective though um you know everybody kind of understands that bitcoin gets mined there's mm-hmm. only going to be so many of them in existence ever therefore as as demand goes up faster than supply they understand right the uh supply demand curve they understand that price goes up yep. essentially a similar thing is happening with ether um but i i don't even i don't quite understand what is the end game for how many ether there is going to be? You know, how, how, how much is, I don't understand the supply equation quite the way I understand the Bitcoin supply equation, especially mm-hmm. with the change in the proofs. So yeah. 
what is what is the impact of that? Yeah, sure. So as far as the uh, as far as that change goes, the change from proof of work to to proof of stake, proof proof of proof of uh, uh, of stake. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, um, is currently underway, and it's what's forecasted to happen last year. Currently forecasted to happen during twenty two, but it's still kind of up in the air. Right. But the but the core point here is that ether has no hard cap. Right. It right, has no hard cap, and that ether can be earned can be issued, can be mined even right now, indirect, different from Bitcoin. But Ether has no hard cap. Right. But but in 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 terms of its asset value going forward, I don't believe having that soft cap or no cap will ultimately hurt it because echoing back on those earlier comments, as really every new application out there uses Ether, I can't buy a NFT with dollars right. or with Bitcoin, okay. you almost always have to buy it with ETH. So, and so all of that will then drive assets into the space. So both uh, Ether and Bitcoin um, have their own S-curves, essentially. Yeah. At, at some point, um, Bitcoin gets to the point where everybody who really wants it as a store of wealth will have it. Mm -hmm. I've equated it to digital gold. I have no idea how high that makes its range. I mean, we've seen gold in a range for a decade now, right? Almost a decade. And mm -hmm. it hasn't broken out to new highs. Um, at what point, but but that took <laughs> centuries. So at what point does Bitcoin get to the choppy range? And I don't know. I mean, what if all the billionaires in the world and all the billion dollar corporations all decide we're going to put 1% into Bitcoin? What does that make the price? <laughs> Pretty high. Higher, higher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, higher, right? And, <laughs> and I would think that, especially for the ultra wealthy, um, to just have that long-term generational store of wealth is valuable to them. Now, mm -hmm. if I end up someday being worth eight figures, um, would I be super interested in Bitcoin? I don't know if eight figures is enough. I mean, I guess at this point, if you just believe it's going higher, you buy it as an investment mm -hmm. until it starts leveling off on you. And then you have to decide, am I rich enough to keep it forever? Um, that's why, I, you know, I don't want any Bitcoin now other than what I won playing online poker in 2020 during the uh, lockdown. <laughs> and, you know, so I got, <laughs> I got like, I, I won like a little under a half a half a Bitcoin. And it just sits there. I got it over. At, I, I, I won, got it, finally got it over to Coinbase. And, um, you know, I just let it sit there. I, but I dollar cost average into Ethereum every month. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's all very interesting there is, you know, how are all these things going to end up playing together? And how long are these time frames? So for somebody who's worried that, well, I missed it, it's too late to get into Bitcoin or Ether, I would still tell them buy the dips. Um, yeah, yeah. I'd be looking for big dips, 30, 40, 50% dips, because I think that's the kind of volatility. Um, Bitcoin or the, the crypto leverage, you know, estimate that's out there is basically saying that, Crypto, as of a month ago, is as leveraged as it ever been. So now the prices are coming down. Presumably, mm -hmm. the leverage is coming down, and you'll get to a point where you're at normal leverage. Um, you know, for stocks, that's you know maybe one and a half or two to one. Um, but you know, who knows what it is for crypto? It, you know, it was a hundred to one last April, right, or something like that. Yeah. Um, it's crazy. Yeah. So there's a ton of leverage which drove the prices, and as leverage comes out, uh, which I'm trying to tell people is going to happen in the stock market if if the Fed mm -hmm. really does shrink the balance sheet, um, you know, you know, I just, I just, man, I, I, I'm, I'm like, man, you know, I think I, I'll, I'll probably buy some Bitcoin if it really gets down into the twenties again, you know, the 20,000, you know, I think that 20 to 30,000 range is the, like a, a pretty hard floor. Um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of technical guys are saying 37,000. I don't know. I just, I just wait for the momentum to be done going down. And then I pick up the knife off the ground. Um, yeah, I might miss the first move up. Um, as far as, uh, the reporting for taxes goes, there have been a lot of people talking about, um, the change from $10,000 reporting down to $600 reporting. Is that pretty much aimed at crypto? Is that, is that what that's for? Are they, are they just, are they basically cracking down on anything digital finance? Well, it's, well, the end outcome is, is for any, uh, FinTech payments, but the actual law or the for the clause in the law, it was developed uh, to crack down on crypto transactions. It was, right. Okay. So pretty, absolutely. pretty, pretty clearly. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I know back during July and August, there was there was a huge hubbub 
over actually that clause and the reclassification of who is a crypto broker. Right. So now basically, and, and I believe the law only actually takes effect January 1st, 2024. So, so it's not overnight, but pretty quick that basically any business or individual that, that gets over 10 grand in crypto payments okay. during any during any 12 month annual period, okay. either as a lump sum invoice or as part of a payment plan on a bigger invoice. All right. of those so no or layering. any of no, yeah. no no layering. Okay. Yes. I remember yeah. that from my uh, uh the laundering the money laundering test. Right? <laughs> money laundering test. Yeah, um, we gotta take you know that. how to do it. Yeah, yeah to make oh no to make sure that you get a foreign client or somebody messing around with insurance policies that they're not actually yeah. laundering money. We're supposed to, you know, make a phone call. Ah, I think this guy's laundering money, you know, I mean, which integrate layer. Yes. And then cash out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I, I remember those. Uh, okay. So, yeah. so this is really the, so the new rules are basically a way of thwarting layering more than anything. Yeah. It, Cause then that interferes and, with integrating. Yep. No. And and so basically the um, so the whole upshot, though, is that if you as an individual or a business are not in compliance come, come 2024, you are going to have to owe you know, fees and penalties. But it's also a actual crime right. felony to, uh, to not be in compliance with these issues. So they are obviously after the money, but they're also after the compliance sort of this, this change has some actual teeth to it. And so I know that that a whole that I've talked to personally about 20 tax lawyers and all of them are quite anxious as to how this will ultimately play out. Right. Well between now and then they still have to write essentially the um the rules. Mm -hmm. so, I mean the law is yeah. there. Yeah now the law is there. The rules, what does the law mean? Exactly. How yeah. it's going to be interpreted by the Treasury, the IRS, all the rest. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, the one that I found interesting is they're they I think right now they're classifying minors as they got a report. Yep. Yeah. And the miners saying, well, that doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, it kind of does because you're creating money and whether you keep it or 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 not. Right. If you keep it, it should be reported. Right. You, you made money somehow. Right. It's whether it's income or or a spontaneously combusted asset. I don't know. Um, spontaneously combusted. That's, a, that's yeah. a new one. That's a new one. Put that there. Right, it's an asset. Current assets, non-current assets, combustible assets. There we go. Right. Yeah. So, you. <laughs> you know, so I, you know, I, I get that they want to track it. I do. Um, where I thought it could be a problem is, especially at the NFT level, is if they have kind of duplicate reporting, right? You got to report, you got to report, you got to report. And we're all saying, but it's only one transaction. Why should we talk about it three times? So that's the thing where I think they have to be efficient. Um, I know that they want to overlap because they don't know who really, I don't think they probably knew who they have to target. Um, but I think that that's where the rules are going is how are they going to keep this all efficient um, without disrupting the fact that this should be hugely efficient, right? You know, this the whole point of all this is to be more efficient, to be cheaper. Well, let's let let's get the reporting, but let's not muck it up either. You know, and defeat the fact that this technology is pretty neat. You know, it, it could do a lot of things. You know, so you know, given that we have a labor shortage, maybe it's not a bad thing that a couple couple uh, paper pushers uh, push less paper. I don't know. Um, on the accounting side, since that's uh, kind of a big deal in that. Um, mm -hmm. um, what do you see coming for how does a regular person keep track of this? Is, is it going to be like the brokerages where they're just required to give you your records now? I mean, it used to be, I don't even know how many years ago this changed, but early in my career, we had to go back and like track down records for trades and things like that. It wasn't required that the brokerages just kept this history for you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that all this at the, you know, at the Coinbase level or whoever you're using, Binance, whatever, um, they're, they have every single transaction from day one. You're never gonna have to worry about getting those transactions, are you? Well, um, I say yes and no, right? Oh boy. Because absolutely platforms like Kraken, Celsius, Coinbase, right. Finance US, all of them do absolutely have all of your transactions on their records, 
right? And they and they have been uh, sort of voluntarily handing over that information to clients for, for following the the IRS, basically following them all into court and then forcing them to hand over records anyway. So now all uh, all all of the big major players have been trying to voluntarily issue data of that kind. So then yes, but no, right? The the because basically in most cases the average person only gets a a file dump of their transactions no no uh like easy you know profits and just gains for the year it's right. a file dump of your transactions so not like the form that we get with our our, Correct. our stocks and mutual funds to say cost basis what you sold 1099 bs yeah 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 so yeah i mean we aren't quite at that point yet i would argue that probably by the end of, of the year we are going to be there uh at the bigger players right. but 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 in, in terms of tracking and calculating and then actually paying taxes there are any number of of tax software companies out there whose whole model is, is actually doing that helping you understand interpret uh work with this you know big dump file to have an answer right and one of the reasons i use coinbase is because they just seem to make it really easy and yeah, yeah i was just like okay, i use coinbase too yeah yep. it, it's about being easy for me right yes. you know i mean i there's only so many brain cells and so many minutes, you know, you just want it to be easy. Right. So Absolutely. I've been happy with them and I'm sure there's other places that are easy and secure and everything else. Um, what do you think is the most overlooked thing in, in crypto right now? What is it that people should say, aha, I, I should pay attention to that. So what I would say that the most overlooked thing right now in crypto, probably part one is how quickly, uh, Stable coins are ultimately going to become part of our everyday transaction, all right. right? Because all of them are options now on MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, and actually PayPal is in the process of actually offering their own. Right. So it's it's here and it's a real option. It's already here. And then two, what is kind of being talked about right now, but almost more uh, as a joke, is this whole idea of this virtual reality, augmented reality metaverse type thing that is a backdoor way to to get crypto being used by all kinds of people on a everyday basis be it gamers be it corporations be it be it entities so actually Kurt, just yesterday the first accounting firm opened up a office in the metaverse really? so it's a conservative obviously it's a conservative industry corporate accounting opened up a, a firm office in the metaverse. What so then how, mean? so, well, well, I've actually contacted them, have yeah. not heard back yet, but, uh, but I would assume basically it's going to be sort of a virtual reality office client meeting type of option going it's forward. Like a super chat. And so basically, yes. Uh, so it's like a mix between Sims, super chat and uh, uh, ready player one. All right. For um, audits, for for audits, though. So okay, you know, when I went to CES uh, back in 2020, I was they had a whole building dedicated to gaming. I mean, it had mm -hmm. to be a third of the floor space was just gaming, and that's when it hit me in the head. Holy cow, electronic arts! And you know, I mean, I've been in them before, but it never really completely dawned on me what a big deal gaming is. And it's huge. It's, it's, it's isn't it like it's around a quarter of the population games or something. It's a big yep. number. So, uh, you know, and if I didn't suck at it, I'd probably do it too. You know, I mean, I, I, yeah, I used to, I used to play a game called Gradius and it was like, doo, 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 you know, and, and you know, I, you know, then we got into the games where like stuff really moved and I was like, I'm out. Give me a golf <laughs> game. I'll take a golf game, you know? Yeah, there we go. But there's so many people that game that and they understand those interfaces and they're comfortable so if they can do things like rather than going to the amazon website shop in the metaverse and so yep. that you can see everything 3d right so amazon's going to have to have its own metaverse i gotta gotta believe oh, right yeah. and and facebook is we already know that that's mm -hmm. their thing so the whole experience is going to be integrated with cryptocurrency is what you're saying and stable coins and so you can do your shopping maybe wow so so amazon is going to go meta is what it sounds like and and then that'll that'll drive more currency more stable coins more stable coins yeah. means more short-term treasuries get to be issued 
That's interesting. Mm-hmm. It's okay. I, 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 you know, I, I saw that as your, as one, you know, how metaverse is going to be involved. And I didn't read this article as the newer one. Um, I'll have to read that because that, you know, people think about how long things will take. This is one of the CEOs at uh, CES was talking about. He's like, people think about how something will take two years and then they get frustrated when it takes 10. And then there's other things, demise of oil, um, that you think is going to take <laughs> 10 or 20 years and it's only going to take a few. Um, yeah. So it, 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 am I thinking about this right? This is just going to happen way faster than people are giving it credit for right now. Ad- adoption of all the all these technologies in particular the way of doing transactions with those th- i think so yes lines. right yeah. and and so the whole conversation on on sort of gaming and 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 sort of the the sheer you know, number of people who game it's also important to point out that over the last maybe three four five years that as games have transitioned from being on on discs to being in the cloud right. that that a big part of that how those games are now actually monetized is not paying upfront always. It's right. it's actually in-game purchases, and so right. it's a super obvious connection for in-game purchases in a virtual reality in the metaverse that to buy things, to transact, to buy the new armor upgrade or the new anything in this game or this reality. It makes perfect sense to use a virtual currency and to use a blockchain secured currency to to make sure that all of the transactions happen as advertised so it makes perfect sense as you actually take a bigger picture at gaming and all of the other things that then go around and into gaming so there's even more capture for internet commerce to come absolutely wow so internet commerce just keeps getting bigger the cloud just keeps getting bigger uh, the digital transactions come even bigger and bigger and bigger. That supports treasuries because uh, they need yep. to uh, have those. Well, okay. So there's a lot of real estate redevelopment that's going to have to be done because there's a lot of places that are going to close in their current form. They're just not going to. So, yeah. They're just, the whole Amazon effect is going to, there's a whole nother wave of it coming then. And, mm-hmm. and, and the cryptocurrencies will be part of it. Huh. All right. Uh, well, I tell you what, you have something really cool going on at Lehman College. Why don't you, uh, Talk about that for a second to close it out, because I think that you know, if people are coming down to a decision about where to get educated and they want to get into this world, you're you're doing you're a, you're a first mover. You got first mover advantage. Yes, sir, we do. So, uh, Lehman College actually, our d our d department economics and business as of July first, twenty twenty two, is actually going to be its own school of business going forward and i believe it's it's only the the third school of business in the whole cuny network of 27 colleges so uh, uh obviously that's a huge deal for us and then also during this fall semester we actually just offered our first blockchain course our first crypto course built developed and and currently taught right here by me and then and then next fall our first class at the master's level focusing on Blockchain, crypto, AI, RPA is on the books to be uh, up and running then too. So a ton of stuff going on at Lehman, forward thinking. I'm really amped for it. And I'm there on the ground doing it too. So, so I'm excited how for fast, it. How fast can I audit that class and buy it with a stable coin? Um, well, the, ah. well, the courses are, are open to be audited. Okay. And I'm sure, and I'm sure that, I could talk to the folks uh, in uh, in the bursar's office and then have some payment portal set up for you. I would think I would. Yeah, I would think for sure. It's, it's, a, it's a blockchain class and, you know, use PayPal to send over some stable coin or Coinbase to send over some stable coin might be might be the <laughs> might be making the point for you. So, all right. There we go. <laughs> all right. I, I really, I really appreciate the time. And, um, you know, I asked some, some layman questions just because uh, I think it comes better from you that you give a better explanation than I do. You know, I'm, I've been following Bitcoin for about seven, eight years, whatever it is now. And I bought some, traded it, bought some, trading it. It would have been better for me to just hold it. Um, <laughs> Right. I mean, even though the trades were profit profitable, I, I, there was holes and I missed yeah. those run ups. Um, I, I guess I want to finish with one thing. There's one thing you could tell me if you don't want to talk about it. Um, so so here is something that I've told people and I don't know that 
who, who created Bitcoin. I know that the guy in Florida says he did it. Um, I think that's where either Australia, wherever, wherever this guy that just had the lawsuit was. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. But uh, at one point, not too long ago, a couple of years, uh, and for a number of years, like 90% of the Bitcoin was mined in China. Mm-hmm. And yep. that wealth, which is basically they paid for electricity and computers and everything else to do this space, um, air conditioning, you know, whatever, wherever it took, they put all this expense into mining Bitcoin. And then the Bitcoin left the country. A lot of mm-hmm. cases. So it was a way of turning uh, Yuan or Renminbi uh, mm-hmm. into Bitcoin, into whatever they, you know, if they're still sitting on the Bitcoin, but, you know, if they sold the Bitcoin into another currency. And sometimes that currency turned into the United States real estate because we've had mm-hmm. all that foreign direct investment. Yep. To what extent do you think there's still a ton from, from the money in audit? autocratic regimes to what extent do you still think that there's a ton of bitcoin essentially laundering money out of places like china which i gotta think that that's way beaten down i mean even the casinos that in macau they cracked down on so i mean i know there's a lot of money getting laundered out of the casinos in macau too so you know is there is there money getting pulled out of a lot of these eastern european places that are mining cryptocurrency um is it moving to the united states so fast that it's not going to be a money laundering thing anymore. I mean, because Bitcoin clearly got used for a lot of money laundering. Um, I, I wonder how much of it happened here. I, I, I don't really know. I can't imagine a lot. But, you know, is that something that people have to think, oh, this, there's a dark, shady side to this? Or is that pretty much like you said earlier, it's all kind of being normalized out of existence? I mean, so, you know, I would say that to answer that question, there are a there are a handful of items to just list really quickly. And that, yes, in China, I would say Bitcoin mining and trading at at this point is probably done. Right. That, that there is no more Bitcoin mining and actually quite a bit of the mining moves to uh, uh, Kazakhstan. And so it's during this past week, all of that political un, unrest, the rioting, all the rest of that also in turn has been... Uh, Helping drive the price lower, so so the mining has moved and it put you quite a bit of it moved here to right. Texas and to Idaho, actually. So all of that it probably probably was used by by folks to get around the capital controls in China. But I mean, you know, there are individuals, businessmen, and enterprises that are actively trying to get capital out of China anyway. So it was a tool, but it is not. And currently was not the only school either. And so to answer your actual question, right? Is there a dark side to Bitcoin? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, every tool has a dark side, right? right. The internet, the internet has the dark web. Right. I mean, obviously, right? Every tool has a dark side, right? The right, the dollar also uh, also what? has a dark side too. No way. I know the dollar <laughs> can be used for money laundering, Terrorist financing, Larry blood diamonds, child yeah. labor, integrate layer export, right? Yeah. Right. Ozark, right? That whole right. show right there. Um, and so yeah, I mean, obviously, yes, there there is a, a dark side to crypto, but but there's a dark side to to any tool out there, right? And so that's really why the the core point that I always hammer home to people is that you have to do your homework. Right. On the project, on the token, on the NFT, DeFi anything out there you have to understand it not all of the operational guts and the coding and the programming that's that's okay to not understand everything but you have to understand who is in charge how it works and then and then how the economics work in that transaction meaning that 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 i hand over eight thousand dollars what happens to that eight eight grand and then how easy is it for me to get that money back right understanding that is paramount Right. And, and I think that that's what people need to understand. And that's why I went there, because I think the Wild West is slowly being tamed, just like yeah. the real Wild West was. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's too late for people to get involved. Uh, in fact, if I had to make it like a baseball game, I would say that three, through 2017, we were probably in extra innings, or excuse me, in, 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 a, in a batting practice. And yeah. Extra innings are very far away yet. I'd say we're maybe in the second inning, third inning, right in there. Yeah, yeah. 
um you know that that first spike and crash maybe that was the first inning mm -hmm. now I, third inning i'd say third inning and and but the innings can take a long time if you've ever watched major league baseball you understand the innings can take a really long time so <laughs> hours yeah yeah so you know i uh I, I want anybody who watch, you know, the few thousand people who watch this and then however many listen on the podcast on Seeking Alpha and, and Apple, um, you know, take the time to get to know this. Um, I've done a couple of things just, uh, you know, gradually learning about it over a number of years and, uh, you know, trying to understand you know, why Mike Saylor does what he does, why Elon Musk does mm -hmm. what he does. And, you know, and, and Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, these guys, you know, what, whatever you think about your, you know, whatever your perception of them is, the one thing is, yeah, they kind of understand money and, and, and they're doing things that they believe uh, in the intermediate term, at least are going to do well. And probably in the long term are going to do well. I don't know that you always want to think about it like a trader, uh, I think that folks who are are married to trading cryptocurrency are going to be like me, and you know you're going to buy your first batch of Bitcoin at a thousand, sell it at eleven thousand, and you don't get back in till seventeen. You know, so you know, and 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 COVID gave me a chance to to flip it again, and sure enough, I sold it again at twenty, and what did it go up to? You know, fifty two, fifty three, whatever. So. You know, I would love to get it in the twenties again, and I'm sure they're not going to let me, but you know, I do think that the whole dollar cost average, just like with your 401ks folks, your dollar cost average into your 401k into a growth fund because the growth fund does better still really long amount of time. And by dollar cost averaging, you get a decent price. You get an average price. Uh, same thing with this. I think your dollar cost average into Ethereum for sure. So I think the use cases are interesting and Right, you'll be able to earn interest on that at some point. Uh, you can loan yes. it out, right? Yep. And I don't think people all understand that. Um, Bitcoin, I think if if you really want long term multi generational store of wealth, certainly can buy the the corrections, or you can dollar cost average into it. You know, if you have a, a stream of income that you're not going to use, you, know, you take part of that. Uh, I did tell folks during the uh, crash in summer 2020 in crypto is take a few percent of your bank savings if you have adequate bank savings mm -hmm. and and put it in the crypto and then and then learn about the the interest paying programs for loaning it out uh which basically is what stimulated all the leverage right so i i can't imagine that you're still getting 16 percent on loaning out your 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 bitcoin but you know who knows um i know i was making like five or six percent on ethereum mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's becoming normal, I guess, would be where I was trying to get to with this whole conversation and, and getting involved uh, now um, and, and incrementally, right? Don't, don't just all jump in with a whole bunch of money because you might be buying at just the wrong spot and take five years to get your money back, you know, just like with stocks. But if you, if you scale in over time, the runway here, 10 years at least, got to be mm -hmm. 10 years at least, right? If not yeah. quite a bit longer. So it's, so, it's yeah. hard to find 10 year runways. And I, I think this is a 10 year plus runway. So unless you tell me different, if I read in an article and you say, Oh, it's all about to end, I'm going to be like, ah, <laughs> but, uh, no, I, 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 I've been reading your article. I just didn't get the one from yesterday. I just saw the headline. Um, if you had to do a calculation, I'm gonna put you on the spot right now. How okay. high is Bitcoin going to go someday? Is it going to go to 10 million? Is it going to go to a zillion, a Brazilian, uh, uh, right? You know, <laughs> is there a way to calculate that? I don't need an, a number number, but how would we calculate? What do we, because I've seen people do it. Yeah. I have no idea what's right. How do we really calculate? Do we say something like I said earlier? What is it worth if all the billionaires put 1% of their money into it? Um, what I would say there, and, and that obviously there are, you know, Price targets that range from a hundred grand up to one million, ten million dollars, right? So no one actually knows. But the but the two best sort of processes that I've seen heard about anecdotally is that one sort of echoing on your point. What if Bitcoin takes the place of private equity or of a goal, or or is it then basically treated as a commodity going forward, as that store of wealth going forward? And that's probably now I have no idea how accurate it's actually going to turn out to be. But I'd say doing it that way is probably the most logical way to try to work out a price target. And 
I know that the gold parallel is often talked about, but it's probably the parallel and the asset that is kind of the closest to what Bitcoin is being argued for going forward, right? Right, because right, the the because the only way to get Bitcoin to hit any of those price targets is if one, it it is never used as a currency, right? right? And two, it has to be treated basically as a economic hedge, aka gold. Right. And so I would say, yeah, that that if gold overall makes up, I don't know, five five percent of most large institutional holding, then then if Bitcoin comes in and is able to take half of that, right? right. Uh, so it has been two and a half, two and half percent. Yes, absolutely. And so then uh, if that pace you know, goes forward and there's some other institutional buying, like a micro strategy, all the rest, you know, that's probably the best way to try to get to some logical answer. I don't know how well it's ultimately going to work, but that's the way that I've seen reference to most of it. Pretty awesome. I think there's a lot for people to, to really think about because like I said, at a minimum, this belongs as you know, should take some of people's bank savings. Um, Cause I still don't like any of the um, securities products. I, mean, I, I will say none of the ETFs excite me. Um, if you really want Bitcoin, learn how, you know, get, get a purse, get a wallet and, and, and buy some Bitcoin or, or Ethereum or yeah. like I said, dollar cost average into it. It's so easy to do with Coinbase. I just get an email. We're about to take the money out of your bank account and, and buy Ethereum. I'm like, okay, all right. <laughs> That's what I told you to do. So yeah, go at it. Right. Have at it. Yeah. I don't even look at that. I, I literally, I look at that account once a month just because, you know, I, I check to see on Coinbase if they have the little learn and earn thing and I can, I can do a tutorial and earn $2 in, you know, in, in whatever currency that they're, they're hawking that day. Yeah. Cause they want to get people involved, right. They want to yep. get people to understand it and it's want worth, to normalize it. Yes. It's worth, it's worth just a little bit. It's their advertising budget, yep. you know? Yeah. So it's interesting stuff. Good luck on on the whole rollout of the the blockchain classes and yeah it's you know when unit folks when universities start teaching this stuff it's real yeah. I guess that's all I get is real you know where it's gonna go we have some ideas um, but I think the main answer is Ethereum and Bitcoin and maybe a couple of competitors to Ethereum um, mm-hmm. are gonna do well you know I am on record of saying that ninety nine percent of cryptos are going to zero. Um, but it's that one percent, which is for sure going to be Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, yeah. Okay, not going to let you go. What competitors to Ethereum do you should we at least learn about before we make a decision on whether to buy them? Is there two or three that you'd say, say learn um, about these competitors? Yeah, I'd say probably two. One is Car uh, Dono <laughs> and Cardano. and uh, let's say Polkadot. Really? Yeah, very very. Interesting application, not so much linked to crypto, but actually linked to having all of these different blockchains okay. actually talk to each other, right? To to try to build that sort of blockchain internet almost. And also just a extra one in here, Helium. Okay. It's a it's a token based around this internet of uh, things that I've heard quite a bit about and that I think is quite interesting. That is the one that is very hooked into um uh 5g communication isn't yep. it? Okay. yes it is i know i yep. know somebody who i respect who's been talking about it all right thanks a lot you have a great uh rest of the week and uh good luck with everything all right kirk thank you so much again yeah you take care